Uh, it's my privilege to introduce Professor Kang to you, uh, who is, uh, Professor Kang is a physician scientist who for many years was a professor of microbiology and head of the di division of gastrointestinal sinusins in uh, the Wel Wellcome Trust Laboratory at Christian Medical College in Wello. She trained in Wello, she did her MBBS, her MD, and her PhD from there. 1986, 1991, and 1997, respectively. Professor Kang's groundbreaking work has been recognized with numerous awards and honors. These include the Women Bioscientist of the Year from the Government of India in 2006, the Infosys Prize in Life Sciences in 2016, the election to the Fellowship of the American Academy of Microbiology in 2010, the Indian Academy of Sciences in 2011, the National Academy of Sciences in 2013, the Faculty of Public Health in the UK in 2015, and the Indian National Academy, uh, National Science Academy in 2016. She has played a pioneering role in biomedical sciences through serving on numerous national and international editorial boards, research grant review boards, and scientific advisory committees. Recently, Professor Kang was appointed as the Executive Director of the Translational Health Service and Technology Institute, an autonomous institute of the Department of Biotechnology in Faridabad in, in India. I welcome Professor Kang to deliver this lecture. What I'm going to be talking to you about is a bit of a love story. This particular virus that you see here is the rotavirus. It's interesting that the Infosys introduction to science starts with the wheel. And rotavirus is called rotavirus because it is a wheel-shaped virus when you see it on electron micrographs. This is a virus that was discovered in 1973 and impacts us all. I'm going to be telling you a story, and that story is of a vaccine that was made for India and by India. The way I've structured this talk is to talk to you about the disease burden and then about the vaccines that were made elsewhere, then take you through rotavirus vaccine development in India and what the future holds for us. Now, this is a picture that is familiar to anybody who has ever been an intern or been in a remote area. You see a child come in with dehydration and you recognize that if you can't get them to be orally rehydrated or get an IV line in, these are children that are likely to die. And among the causes of dehydrating gastroenteritis, Group A rotaviruses are the most common. Now, Group A rotaviruses are viruses that have a double-stranded RNA genome. And this 11-segmented virus actually has 12 proteins, six of which are structural and six are non-structural. Among the structural proteins, the ones that are most important are the ones that you see here on the surface. The red protein is the VP4. The yellow protein that you see here is the VP7. And the blue is the VP6. When people think about rotaviruses, one useful comparison is to think of flu. Flu has different H types and different N types. Rotavirus has different G types and different P types. The Gs are the yellow protein and the reds are the P protein. So if you look at rotavirus, when you think about a vaccine, first you have to think, do we really need a vaccine? How do you decide whether a vaccine is required for a disease and then whether a vaccine can really be made for that disease? So if you look at rotavirus gastroenteritis, this is the most common cause of severe diarrhea in children under five. It is a virus that affects rich and poor, that affects every part of the globe. 
the only continent from which rotavirus has not yet been reported is Antarctica. Everywhere else, children are infected with rotavirus, not only human children, animals as well. So there are cow rotaviruses, there are bird rotaviruses, there are sheep rotaviruses, you name it, there are even mouse rotaviruses. So rotavirus spreads very easily. It has multiple modes of transmission, and that's a reason why it is acquired by everyone. In co more contaminated environments, it is acquired earlier, so you see early infections in developing countries. Antibiotics don't work for rotavirus, as for all viral infections, that it can be a problem. And improvements in hygiene, sanitation, and drinking water do not adequately prevent rotavirus infection. They can delay it, but they can't prevent it. If you look at how much the burden of rotavirus is, if you look at all diarrheal deaths, 37% of all diarrheal deaths are due to rotavirus. And if you look at this map here, you can see why we need to be studying rotavirus in India. Now, these are mortality estimates, but there are also estimates of severe diarrhea that puts children in hospital. And this is the rotavirus surveillance network that is run by the WHO. There are also other networks, such as one in India, that provide data on how much rotavirus is putting children in hospital. And there are a number of WHO reference laboratories, and my own lab in Velo is one of them. Now, in addition to the studies by WHO, there have also been other studies in low- and middle-income countries that have looked at the causes of severe gastroenteritis in children. One of the most famous and exhaustive studies that was done recently is called the GEMS study for Global Enterics Multi-Site Study. And here, if you look at moderate to severe diarrhea, what you can see here is that in infants, rotavirus is the number one cause of severe diarrhea by any measure. The same thing for toddlers, children between 12 and 23 months of age, and rotavirus is the number two cause in children between three and five years of age. So rotavirus, by far, is the biggest cause of moderate to severe gastroenteritis. In the GEMS study, we had one site in Kolkata that looked at all the causes of diarrhea in their children. And I'd just like to walk you through the figures so that you understand how much of this disease exists. So you can see that rotavirus is the number one cause of diarrhea. What that slide shows is that if you have 100 children and you follow them up for a year, 25 of those 100 children, if they are in the infant age group, will have a moderate to severe gastroenteritis that is caused by rotavirus. That is, one in four children in Calcutta in that particular area need to see a physician or be hospitalized because of rotavirus gastroenteritis. So this is a big problem. Now, how do you look at burden of disease? I told you about the deaths, and you saw the figures there. I've told you about hospitalizations. And in the hospitalizations in India, we were fortunate to have the Indian Council for Medical Research help us to establish a network of laboratories across the country to look at rotavirus gastroenteritis. What we do in that study is every child that is admitted for diarrhea, we collect a stool sample and test it for rotavirus. Over time, we built up 28 hospitals who participated in that network. And if I were to summarize the results, those results demonstrate that 36% of all children who are hospitalized for diarrhea in India in all the four regions, 
are there because of rotavirus. In addition to the studies that we have done in hospital, in Velo and in Delhi, we have been doing studies in the community that look at rotavirus gastroenteritis. And here you tend to look at, are children infected? Do they have diarrhea or not? So you're looking at a milder form of disease than you see through hospitalizations. And through that, we've been able to build up a picture of rotavirus gastroenteritis across the country. There are approximately 11 million episodes of diarrhea due to rotavirus seen in children every year. That means that one in two children will have a rotavirus diarrhea. Now, these can be mild diarrheas, which can be treated at home, and everybody has a remedy for how diarrheas are to be treated. Then you have a slightly more severe diarrhea where parents take their child to hospital and one in eight Indian children will wind up in a hospital or a clinic to be treated for diarrhea. The next is a severe diarrhea that requires hospitalization and there we estimate that somewhere between one in 30 to one in 60 children will need to be hospitalized for rotavirus gastroenteritis. And sometimes children don't come to hospital or children come to hospital too late and then they die because of rotavirus gastroenteritis. And it's been estimated that around one in 350 children born in India every year will die of a rotavirus gastroenteritis the numbers are staggering. And as I demonstrated to you, water sanitation and hygiene can only delay infections because the Western world sees infections at a later stage, but still sees them. Given our disease burden, clearly we need a vaccine. We need to be able to prevent disease if possible. But which vaccine? Will that vaccine work? And can we afford the vaccine? are important questions for our public health program. If you look at the development of rotavirus vaccines, the development process actually started almost when the vaccine, was, when the virus was first discovered. People started looking at, could they follow the same principles that had been followed for smallpox, where you use the cowpox virus to prevent smallpox disease. So they looked at were there animal viruses that they could use for this purpose. They also looked at can we adapt human viruses to cell culture, attenuate them, and then make a vaccine like we did for polio. So there were a number of different approaches that were tried. Most of them were not very good. But in the 1990s, we finally had a vaccine. This vaccine was called RotaShield. It was developed by the National Institutes of Health. It was based on a monkey-human reassortant virus. It was licensed in 1998, used first in the US with three doses of vaccine. And it started off very well, and then there was disaster. The rotavirus vaccine seemed to cause intersusception. So what they saw was intersusception is a folding in of the gut on itself. 175 cases of intersusception were reported through an adverse event surveillance network in the US. And it was estimated that there was one case of intersusception per 10,000 vaccinated infants. Now, some intersusceptions can be diagnosed quite easily on ultrasound and they can be reduced by giving an enema. Some of them where the blood supply becomes compromised may require a resection of the gut. And if an intersusception does not get treated, a child might actually die. So in the US where healthcare is pretty good, out of the 175 cases of intersusception, only one child died. 
But when they looked at the data in much greater detail, they found that the cases of intersusception were actually quite closely clustered together, where the greatest risk of intersusception was in the first week after the first dose of vaccine. And this was a 30-fold elevation of risk. Later analysis also showed that the risk was greater in children because they did catch up immunization. It happened that there is a periodicity. Intersusception happens in children anyway. It is the commonest surgical emergency in, in, in children. It was there before rotavirus vaccines were introduced. But with rotavirus vaccines, you seem to increase that risk in that window after the first dose. So the vaccine was withdrawn and people began to think, now what shall we do? We know that diarrhea kills a lot of children, but can we take the risk that intersusception will kill some children as well? And in the US, they decided to withdraw the vaccine. People thought a lot about developing new vaccines, but finally went ahead. GSK and Merck, two multinational vaccine companies, developed two new rotavirus vaccines. Both of them underwent very large trials in 60 to 70,000 infants each. And these were trials that were designed to assess the risk of intersusception similar to that which had been seen with RotorShield. Now, the cost of these vaccines was approximately $200 a course, and I'd like you to hold that thought. The first vaccine was Rotorix. It's derived from a human strain. It's given as two doses of vaccine. And when they evaluated this vaccine, it had about 85% efficacy. It was able to prevent severe disease or hospitalizations due to rotavirus gastroenteritis. And in terms of intersusception, they did not see a signal of intersusception with this particular vaccine. The other vaccine was made by a US company, Rotatech. This was also a reassortant, but this was between bovine rotaviruses and human rotaviruses. It was a multivalent vaccine, and it was given as three doses. In this vaccine as well, the vaccine efficacy was very high, above 90%. And the number of cases of intersusception were no different than between the children who received vaccine and the children who got a placebo. So both vaccines were safe and effective, but expensive. Nonetheless, the WHO recommended that these vaccines be used globally. And in India, there was never any question of us being able to afford a vaccine where the starting price was $200, because we have a birth cohort of 27 million. And to be able to give vaccines to all of our children, we cannot afford a vaccine that is more than $2 a dose. And here we were talking about vaccines that were $70 to $100 a dose. So now I'm going to take you through the development of an Indian vaccine, and I'll give you a brief reintroduction to how vaccines are evaluated. When you think about vaccines, one thing is very important. You must remember who a vaccine is given to. Vaccines are given to healthy people. Drugs are given to sick people. Vaccines are given to healthy people. So therefore, the bar for safety of a vaccine has to be much higher than it is for drugs. Now, you can't also have a vaccine that barely works, unless the disease is very, very severe and likely to kill people, then you'll say, okay, I'll take a 20% chance of preventing disease there. So you want something that is highly efficacious, that has high safety requirements, that is given a limited number of times that is cheap and affordable for programs. And an important thing to remember is that vaccines are given to infants. Infants have immature immune systems. So vaccines really need to be very safe and work very well before they can go into programs. 
So therefore, we have a very rigorous testing process for vaccines. There is a lot of preclinical studies that go on in animals. And then you have phase one, two, and three before licensure. Phase one is safety and immunogenicity. That is in 10 to 100 participants. Phase two is safety and immunogenicity. And this goes into a larger number, usually in the target population. And it's usually 100 to 1,000 participants. And when you look for efficacy, it can be 1,000 to 10,000. Or as you saw in these studies, it was 60,000 people participating in the study. And then post-licensure, you can monitor for safety, for impact, for a variety of different things. And here, you will look at the vaccine in very large numbers of people. So in phase one, you look in healthy adult volunteers. And you look for, essentially, safety here. In phase two, you go to the target population. And usually, here, you will do a randomized double-blind control study. And in phase three, you're in the target population. But here, you are actually going to look at disease in that population. In phase four, you look at safety, effectiveness, and persistence of protection. Now, when we come to the Indian rotavirus vaccine, we started with a premise. We were going to work with a human strain. And we were going to work with some unusual human strains. Now, rotaviruses cause disease in children. But there are some peculiar rotaviruses that only infect neonates, so children in the first four weeks of life. And those are stra strange strains and are identified in different parts of the world. The first one was found in Australia by the lady who discovered rotavirus, Ruth Bishop. And that strain is being taken forward for development as a vaccine. Neonatal infections are usually asymptomatic. And in India, there was a neonatal strain that was identified in the nursery of the All India Institute of Medical Sciences by a then fairly young uh, pediatrician, slightly older now, Dr. Bhan who was responsible for taking this forward. So he found that 50% of neonates who were hospitalized for three days were infected with this particular virus. It was an unusual strain of the virus, and they were usually asymptomatic. He went ahead and worked with his collaborators to characterize this strain and demonstrated that the strain was an unusual strain which had a single bovine gene introduced into it. And this was important because they thought that if they had this bovine gene in there, mothers would not have antibodies to it. Remember I told you G and P types of rotavirus? This had an unusual G and an unusual P type. So they thought that maternal antibodies would not interfere with the infant immune response. So they followed up children who had this neonatal infection for about two years. And they found that children who had had the infection had less disease during the follow-up period. So that means this was likely to be a good vaccine candidate. In addition to that, there had been another neonatal strain that was identified in Bangalore. This was called the I321 strain, which was also neonatal, also asymptomatic. And it was decided that the Indo-US Vaccine Action Program, which was a program of the Department of Biotechnology, would take forward the development of this vaccine. So initially, the capacity to do strain characterization was not available in India. So the strains were taken to the US and adapted to cell culture. And at least initially, the phase one studies were done in the US in adults and children. 30 adults and 30 children received this vaccine. And then the vaccine was as a candidate, was transferred to an Indian company, Bharat Biotech Limited, 
and the phase 1 study was repeated in Indian adults. Then the phase 2 studies which were the safety and immunogenicity studies identified a dose for the vaccine again with all of the studies being done at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. Then we wanted to test the efficacy of the vaccine. And while the safety and immunogenicity studies are small, the efficacy studies need to be much larger. So here was where we became involved and we participated with Pune and Delhi in the phase three efficacy studies. Now these were interesting studies. They posed an interesting ethical challenge because there were licensed vaccines that were available in the other parts of the world. So could we do a placebo controlled trial? And at that stage, there was no efficacy data from developing countries and therefore we were permitted to go ahead with the placebo controlled trial. But the requirement was that the safety bar had to be as high as we could possibly make it. So in this study, we gave mobile phones to the families of every child that was enrolled into the study. And any time a child was sick, our study teams were available to go to those children's homes and bring them in if they were sick enough to need to be seen by people. We also had physicians who visited the children's homes if required. So this was a two-year follow-up for safety and for efficacy. And in this study, the children were followed up with home visits or by phone-based surveillance and all of the illnesses were managed by the study team. We started the study in 2011. We finished it towards the end of 2013 and the data became available in early 2014. This is what the vaccine looked like. This is Rotavac. It's a liquid formulation. They have now got, they are now working on a non-frozen formulation, which will be easier to give to children. And this vaccine was given by us at 6, 10, and 14 weeks. So in, we were able to do really good follow-up of the children. We had less than 2% loss to follow-up over a two-year period. So anybody who does clinical trials will tell you that this was a reasonably done study. And if you look at the efficacy of Rotavac, we had 55% efficacy against severe disease or hospitalizations. Now, you remember I told you 85 and 95 for the other vaccines, and we are seeing 55 here. What does this really mean? Well, actually, it meant if you looked at all-cause gastroenteritis, you would prevent one in five hospitalizations. So not just because of rotavirus, because for rotavirus, you would prevent three out of five hospitalizations, taking 60% efficacy. But overall, you could present, prevent one out of five hospitalizations. But why do we have this only 55% efficacy? And that's a question I've been trying to answer for a while. Rotavirus vaccines began to be developed based on this very exciting data from Mexico. And essentially, if you look at the circled fi um, the figures in red here, essentially what this study did was it followed up 200 children for two years, and it looked at when the kids got rotavirus infections, and they measured the number of infections and looked to see whether prior infection prevented severe disease at a later time point. And they found that if you had two rotavirus infections, you would have 100% protection against moderate to severe gastroenteritis, that if you developed a second infection, the severity was always lower than in the first infection, and second infections were likely to be due to another G-type. So based on the findings from this seminal study, people had started to seriously work on rotavirus vaccines. We tried to replicate the study. We thought it was important to know what it would look like in India if you did exactly the same thing. 
So we took a slum area in Velo. We followed a birth cohort of children for three years. And we found that we didn't get the same results as the Mexicans. So if you look at what happened after two rotavirus infections, we only had 57% protection. And after three infections, we had only 79% protection. If you look at the two cohorts, there were differences across them, but none of the differences that really explained why we had this kind of finding. Now, at that stage, when we finished our study, there were still no rotavirus vaccines in India. So we tried to predict what would happen if there was a rotavirus vaccine in India, given the kinds of results that we had found from our community studies. And essentially, what we predicted was this, the dark blue line that we would have somewhere around 45 to 50% efficacy of a vaccine if we saw the same results in our children. And that's exactly what we got. Now, at the same time, there were studies that were set up in Africa and Asia to answer this question actually using vaccines and not doing modeling. And these use the two vaccines that had the very high efficacy in the Western studies, the Merck and the GSK studies. And here you can see in blue where the Merck studies were done. And you can see in brown where the GSK studies were done. And if you look at how those wonderfully performing vaccines in the West performed in Asia and Africa, now you can see that Rotatech gave you 64% efficacy in Africa, 50% efficacy in Asia, and Rotarix gave you 62% efficacy, but it was 50% in Malawi and 75% in South Africa, where living conditions are much better than in Malawi. So our vaccine developed in India performs very similarly to the same in the kinds of environments that other vaccines also get similar efficacy results. So if you look at lower efficacy in developing countries, is that something that's bad? Okay, and here I'd like you to compare two different countries where these trials were conducted. So if you look at Bangladesh and Vietnam, you can see that Bangladesh had 72% vaccine efficacy. Bangladesh had 46% vaccine efficacy. But if you look at the background rate of disease, the background rate of disease was 9.1 episodes of severe rotavirus gastroenteritis per 100 child years in Bangladesh. And it was about 2 in Vietnam. So 9.1 got reduced to 5.9, and 2 got reduced to 0.8. So the 72% efficacy was happening in a background of low disease, and the 46% efficacy was happening in a background of high disease. So if you look at how much disease is actually prevented, number of episodes prevented, it's dependent on how much disease you have. So a low efficacy vaccine can actually have more impact in a high disease setting than a high efficacy vaccine in a low disease prevalence setting. And those figures were replicated in Malawi and South Africa as well. So looking at vaccine introduction in India, I told you about the burden of disease. And when people decide whether to introduce vaccines or not, they need to look at the disease and they need to look at the vaccine. So you need to know how much disease there is. You need to know whether the vaccines actually prevent disease and then figure out whether your system can handle those particular vaccines coming in. So decisions on whether the vaccine should be introduced and when it should be introduced take into account all these. And when you do prioritization, you look at is there significant disease burden? Who is it for? Is it something that has been recommended by WHO? And would the use of the vaccine 
promote equity. So I think I've demonstrated to you that there was a significant, there is a significant disease burden of rotavirus. Is the disease a priority? Anything that kills children at the rates that rotavirus kills children is a priority, both for the medical community and for the public. Is it recommended by WHO? Yes, WHO recommends the use of rotavirus vaccines in every country in the world. It particularly recommends the use of rotavirus vaccines where a lot of children die of diarrheal disease. And in India, that figure is currently 9% of children who die are because of diarrheal disease. Would use of the vaccine promote equity? Rotavirus vaccines have been licensed, available in India, and recommended by the Indian Academy of Pediatrics since 2008. They are being used for rich children, but rich children don't die. Poor children do. So the fact that the government has finally made a decision to introduce the vaccine into India is really a landmark. In March and April 2016, India introduced the Rotavac vaccine into the birth cohort. Initially, it was for 9% of the birth cohort. Orissa, Andhra, Haryana, and Himachal Pradesh got the vaccine first. In 2017, we've had four additional states added. In 2018, we will have UP introducing the rotavirus vaccine as well. So by 2018, 50% of India's children will be receiving a vaccine that is made in India, made for India. Now, what is the potential for this vaccine? What does the future really hold for us? If you look at data here from Mexico, this is the pattern of disease in Mexico. What you see in the lightly shaded areas is what is the winter season. And what you see here are all-cause diarrheal deaths. In red is infants, in blue is toddlers, and in black is children aged three to five years of age. Can you tell me where rotavirus vaccine was introduced? Can you see what happens? This is all-cause diarrheal deaths in Mexico. This is not rotavirus-specific deaths. But you can see that the pattern that you saw in infants disappears in the first year after vaccine introduction. In the next year after vaccine introduction, the little peak that you see in blue, that's gone as well because by that time, that cohort is also children who have been immunized. There is data from Mexico that has followed this pattern of surveillance and it shows that the decrease in diarrheal deaths is being sustained. Okay, and we also look at another low-income country, and you look at what happened with vaccination, and when vaccination was introduced, what happened to diarrhea hospitalizations and to rotavirus positive cases. So rotavirus vaccine prevents deaths and prevents hospitalizations. It's been calculated that despite the problems with the performance of the vaccine, there is a humongous public health impact to be had. And that is a reduction of 50% of episodes in sub-Saharan Africa and 42% of episodes in high mortality Asia. Much better in other places, but at least that much for us. So although vaccine efficacy is lower in poor settings, the impact on severe disease and mortality is high because we have a high incidence of disease. So while we might want the perfect vaccine, we don't have it at the moment, and we should not delay the further use of what is an effective public health tool. Now, one thing that people always ask me is, you know, it's all very well to say it will work. Are you measuring whether it will work? So this is ongoing effort from my group. We are doing a rotavirus vaccine impact assessment study. The phase one, which introduced vaccines into four states. We have 14 hospitals in those four states and in Chandigarh that are carrying out surveillance. 
we started this surveillance before vaccine introduction or with vaccine introduction. We are also doing safety monitoring for intersusception in nine hospitals. A lot of data has been emerging from these studies and we expect that we will be able to do an interim analysis on the efficacy and the impact of these vaccines in the last quarter of 2017. For the safety data on intersusception, we expect to have that next year. So to summarize, India has developed a vaccine made in India, by India, for India. It's now being used in the national program in eight states. It has the potential with current coverage rates to save at least 30,000 children's lives every year. There is a lot of work that remains to be done. We are already monitoring impact and safety. We need to look at strategies to improve the performance of these vaccines. And we also need to look at special populations in tribal children, malnourished children, HIV-infected children. How will these vaccines perform? So it remains for me to thank my funding agencies, and there are a lot of them. And this is the work of a team, very large teams, both in India and elsewhere. None of this could have been done without extensive partnerships. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kang. I now open the floor to questions. Uh, if any of you have any queries or questions, please announce your name, your designation, and then ask your question. I'm Neha Vyas. I'm an assistant professor here in the Research Institute. I'm wondering what is the mutation rate in the rotavirus, and is that a concern? So rotaviruses mutate, they are RNA viruses, and it's estimated that there is every, at least one mutation for every time the viruses replicate, but mostly those mutations tend to be in regions that are not important for the virus to spread. The main way that you see rotaviruses change their genetic structure is actually because of reassortment in mixed infections. And we believe that the re natural reassortment that led to the vaccine that we have would have happened by reassortment between bovine and human strains. That's something that is seen quite commonly. Uh, 